Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic day. I am tired and don't really want to do this, but I don't like saying no to a signed check, so let's just jump in. No, that's... <laughs> it's just jokes. Uh, welcome back to the thir- Wednesday Philip DeFranco show. I'm a little tired and loopy today. But we're going to get through it, so let's just jump into it. And to start things off light today, before we get to the other stuff, let's talk about Kim Kardashian. Kim really uh, being in the news for the, the same reason that she's been in the news for the past 10 years. She's getting dunked on publicly while in no way does it affect her ability to accrue massive amounts of wealth. Though uh, today's story actually in part involves her having accrued massive amounts of wealth. Right, so if you've spent any time on social media in the last 24 hours, you have probably seen Kim Kardashian's birthday post getting torn apart. Yesterday afternoon posting, 40 and feeling so humbled and blessed. There's not a single day that I take for granted, especially during these times when we are all reminded of the things that truly matter. For my birthday this year, I couldn't think of a better way to spend it than with some of the people who have helped shape me into the woman I am today. Before COVID, I don't think any of us truly appreciated what a simple luxury it was to be able to travel and be together with family and friends in a safe environment. And going on to write, after two weeks of multiple health screens and asking everyone to quarantine, I surprised my closest inner circle with a trip to a private island where we could pretend things were normal just for a brief moment in time. We danced, rode bikes, swam near whales, kayaked, watched a movie on the beach, and so much more. I realize that for most people, this is something that is so far out of reach right now. So in moments like these, I am humbly reminded of how privileged my life is. Hashtag this is 40. And it it turns out those posts rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Are many people finding it rather tasteless to post something like this when over 1.1 million people from around the world have died from coronavirus? Millions more now unemployed, struggling to make ends meet. Some say slipped, some say pushed into poverty, people haven't seen their loved ones in months. Which is why, to many, her post sounded like, Hi, Pores. I know you're hurting right now and can't figure out how you're going to feed your family, but please enjoy these photos of my family's expensive vacation. I know I'm lucky to be so fabulously wealthy, so I'll make mention of it to sound sympathetic. I'm really not, though. And, you know, in this we saw a mixture of people angry and others just kind of joking about how out of touch she seems to be. A number of people also hitting her back with that infamous Kardashian meme. My diamond earring came up in the ocean and it's gone. Yeah, there's people that are dying. And also, with this story, I do have to say I have some questions. How exactly do you surprise a group of people and have them go through numerous health checks and quarantine? Because it sounds like at least one part of the story that you are telling is bullshit. Yeah, ultimately with this story, I'm not furious. I'm not angry. I do think that it's tone deaf. I think Kim Kardashian here is guilty of rich personing at the wrong time. Because in general, while I am personally not a big fan of the flex, how many shows, Instagram accounts, whatever, dedicated to kind of lavish, lifestyles. But this, I think, given the timing for a lot of people, I think is more akin to uh, someone going like, oh, this cold bottled water, it's so great. And everyone else is like, I'm dying of thirst. Like because you have bottled water, that doesn't necessarily make you a bad person, but it's not gonna necessarily be appreciated if you're kind of waving it around. Talking about how humbled and blessed you are to have that bottled water. Yeah. There was that. And then let's talk about Joe Rogan popping back up in the news. Of course, Rogan is one of, if not the biggest podcaster in the world. This year, locking down that estimated to be nine figure Spotify deal. You know, since that Spotify deal, there's been a lot more attention and a lot more criticism against Joe Rogan, both from outside commentators as well as internal disputes at Spotify. And since that deal was announced and the old Joe Rogan archive started moving over to Spotify, we've also seen allegations that there was censorship. People saying, oh, I bet Spotify is gonna make it so Joe Rogan can't have on this person, that person on podcasts in the future. But over the past 24 hours, that seems to be very much not the case. With Joe Rogan, once again, bringing on conspiracy theorists and guy who said that Sandy Hook was a hoax, Alex Jones. Right, and so with the release of this episode, it appeared to confirm that Spotify in no way is cracking down on Joe Rogan. It appears to be very much his show. He is still in control, especially considering two years ago, Spotify gave Alex Jones the boot. With, as The Guardian explained, Spotify removing the entirety of one of Jones's podcasts for hate content. With a spokesperson adding, due to repeated violations of Spotify's prohibited content policies, the Alex Jones show has lost access to the Spotify platform. Right, and so with his recent episode, you had Alex Jones fans as well, as I, I would say a lot of Joe Rogan fans happy to see that this episode could still happen, but there was also a lot of backlash, resulting in tweets like, congrats on paying $100 million for the privilege of platforming a man who terrorized Sandy Hook parents. This isn't edgy, it's disgusting. And Joe Rogan hosted far-right conspiracy theorist Alex Jones on his podcast today. They pushed anti-vax conspiracies and broadcasted banned Infowars videos. Rogan continuing to platform these far-right sickos is incredibly gross and dangerous. As far as where Spotify as a company lands with all of this, I haven't seen a public statement as of recording this video. BuzzFeed News reportedly 
contained an internal email from Spotify's chief legal officer and head of global affairs, reportedly wrote that anyone with content concerns should report them to the company's trust and safety team, but noted it's all too common that things are taken out of context. And going on to say we are not going to ban specific individuals from being guests on other people's shows as the episode slash show complies with our content policies. Going on to say Spotify has always been a place for creative expression. It's important to have diverse voices and points of view on our platform. And writing in closing, we appreciate that not all of you will agree with every piece of content on our platform. However, we do expect you to help your teams understand our role as a platform and the care we take in making decisions. But yeah, ultimately that is where we are with this story. And I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts regarding all of this? Are you happy to see Spotify take this stance or do you think it's the wrong move? It's hypocritical. They're just kind of uh, taking care of their investment. Yeah, any and all thoughts you have on this one, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome brought to you by Adams. As you may already know, I've partnered with Adams to make these great masks that I love, but what Adams is actually most known for are their awesome and unique shoes. From fusing together insoles to provide cushion in every move to an odor fighting copper thread lining, Adams takes a whole new approach to shoes. And these sneakers are not only innovative, but more importantly, they are extremely comfortable. You can wear them to work, on long walks, wherever, and honestly, with their clean, minimal style, they will match whatever you are wearing. In fact, their motto is life is complicated, your shoes don't have to be, which translates directly into their unique design and stretchy laces that you only need to tie once and never again. And one of the best parts, Adams actually comes in quarter sizes. So if you're like me, you're somewhere between a 10 and a half and an 11, boom, 10.75, boom, you get that perfect, comfortable fit. So to snag a pair, just go to adams.com slash defranco to get $20 off your first pair of Adams shoes. And do not wait, this deal will only last until November 4th, so check them out today before you miss out. The first bit of awesome today is if you go to Twitter, you follow me uh, at Philly D, and if you retweet today's tweet, pushing out today's show, you uh, may get this. They're no longer available, uh, it's just a few from my, my friends and family uh, package. But yeah. Just a little something. Then Nintendo gave us an October Nintendo Direct mini partner showcase. How to Drink gave us a badass drink for Cobra Kai. We got a trailer for the HBO doc, The Cost of Winning. Wired gave us We Ate Better 15,000 Years Ago. Ty Dollasign gave us a Tiny Desk Home Concert. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about Facebook, the place where your grandma says stuff that makes you go, eh, maybe it wasn't a good idea to give people over the age of 65 the internet. Also, if you're like, hey, Phil, that's ages to steal a phrase that my grandmother once used in a different context. Not all of them are bad. Oh, this is too dark and real. Also something she might have said. <sighs> Jokes that I say to temporarily distract the feeling of impending doom. I feel about society at all times these days. But also, have you ever looked at like your grandparents and your great grandparents and you're like, how did I come from that? Anyway, Facebook, the election, political ads. Right, so like we talked about back in September, Facebook announced a number of new policies aimed at combating misinformation ahead of the election. With the most notable being that the company said that they would ban any new political ads the week before the election. Now, to be clear, that was not a ban on all political ads, just new ones. Campaigns could still run old ones. And in fact, they were even allowed to change the budget on those ads and decide when they would run. Right, under the election week ban, political advertisers were just simply required to submit and run any new ads before midnight Pacific time on Monday. And if at this point you're like, that sounds very easy to exploit. What does that even do? Yeah, with yesterday officially marking seven days before election day, the rollout of that policy did not go great. Almost immediately, we saw Democratic and Republican strategists saying that the ads that they had previously run, right, that, that met Facebook's guidelines had been banned. This, including Eric Frenchman, chief marketing officer at the Republican digital firm Campaign Solutions, who told reporters that several campaigns that he was working with were hit, as well as a Biden spokesperson telling Reuters that an undisclosed number of his campaign's ads were impacted. With Biden's digital director, Rob Flair, taking to Twitter to slam Facebook, calling the company's ban a silly performative pre-election hoop jumping exercise. That also being echoed by Maddie Krieger, the integrated media director at the progressive advocacy organization and super PAC Priorities USA, who said their previously approved ads had been blocked and even with accidental errors, an error like this has a huge impact on our program and our ability to communicate to voters. It's really unacceptable at this stage of the election. And adding that it is such high stakes and that this is a real loss. Honestly, this does matter, right? Facebook has been one of the cheapest and most effective ways for candidates, especially in local races, to share their messages with voters. And while at the end of the day, these glitches might not be a big deal for campaigns like Biden's and Trump's, which have a ton of money and manpower, it can really impact those smaller campaigns that might not have enough financial and physical support for alternative outreach like emails, texts, and phone banking. With those being even more important during a pandemic where in-person outreach like door knocking and campaign events are limited. Now, Facebook, for their part, did say they were trying to address the issues with a spokesperson tweeting. We're investigating the issues of some ads being paused in correctly and some advertisers having trouble
trouble making changes to their campaigns. We're working quickly on these fixes and we'll share an update once they are resolved. But that is also not where the backlash against Facebook and this policy ended. With others noting and arguing that the Trump campaign had actually been allowed to run ads that appeared to violate Facebook's rules. This including an ad that some people claimed violated Facebook's rules on misrepresenting election dates. With that ad showing a picture of Trump with the text, election day is today. With a caption telling people to vote today. As well as another ad that some argued violated the platform's rules against candidates declaring victory before an election. And for that one, I'll actually just read the description. A video in the ad shows the president's face superimposed on a sun with a voiceover pulled from various sources. With the video saying it's morning in America, Donald J. Trump is still president of the United States. Flowers then rise from the ground and open to faces who scream no as the smiling president, now also a hummingbird, uh, flits around. Now, notably, according to reports, these ads are not currently being run, but they are visible in Facebook's ad library as pre-approved ads that can be run, which means that in order to have met Facebook's rules for ads that can be run during election week, they had to have been run at some point before now, which is why some outlets claim that these ads appear to be the Trump campaign's way of getting around the ban. Right, essentially, briefly running ads that were outright incorrect at the time that they were initially run, but then pausing those campaigns and then run them again when they are accurate. Now, Despite that, a few hours after we started seeing media reports about them yesterday, Facebook told reporters that they would be removing the Vote Today ad. With Facebook saying in a statement, as we made clear in our public communications and directly to campaigns, we prohibit ads that say Vote Today without additional context or clarity. However, you also had a spokesperson telling CNBC they would not take down the ad where Trump claimed he was still your president. And this because regardless of the outcome of the election, Trump will still technically be president until January 20th. Right, and while many condemned Facebook for still allowing some of the Trump ads, you had the Trump campaign unsurprisingly surprisingly upset that Facebook removed any of their ads. With Deputy National Press Secretary Samantha Zager accusing the company of censoring political messages to sway the election in favor of Biden. And adding, this is election interference at the hands of the Silicon Valley Mafia and it is dangerous for our democracy. And actually, to that point, I, I wanna close this story out on that note, right? Th this debate of censorship versus lack of moderation. And that's because not only has this debate become more and more heated as we get to election day, but it's also something that's actually being debated literally as I make this video. Right now, there is a Senate hearing with the CEOs of Facebook, Twitter, and Google. And actually, I mean, even the hearing itself has become a subject of contention because where Republicans have more broadly hit the note of social media companies are censoring people and arguing that they are specifically targeting conservatives when they flag or remove what they deem to be disinformation or misinformation. You at the same time have Democrats accusing Republicans of holding the hearing in order to bully the tech giants into giving Trump and other conservatives more favorable treatment. With them also accusing the tech companies of failing to do enough to prepare for this election and what will happen after. And that last part is actually really notable because last month, Facebook said that it will temporarily ban all political ads after the election. Also on that note, Google announced they will do the same. They just announced that yesterday. Right, this in order to prevent politicians from declaring victory or spreading false information and paid content before all the ballots are counted. Which is really significant and a point that bears repeating given the fact that experts and election officials have been saying for months that it could take days, if not weeks, to fully determine the outcome. This despite Trump's insistence otherwise. Yeah, that is where the story ends, and oh my god, there's only two more Philip DeFranco shows before it is election day. Ugh. The season, or maybe series finale of America, uh, is around the corner. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. Of course, as always, thank you for being a part of my daily dives in the news. Also, if you're new here, definitely join the family, hit that subscribe button so you get these new videos delivered to you. Also, if you wanna make sure you never miss a notification, cause sometimes, you know, certain videos may not get pushed to subscribers. You can give me a text at 813-213-4423. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.